All right, this uh, video blog isn't gonna be a work of art or anything, but um, let's just uh, review some chapters. So um, let's start with the uh, rhetorical act, chapter two. So that one's about reading rhetorical acts. Um, so it just talks about um, how to read analytically. So there's a few like main points that you need to know about. Um, and so those are purpose, audience, persona, tone, evidence, structure, and strategy. And each of these are important in their own way. Um, purpose, um, it's important to know the purpose of, of what you're reading, um, like why why the author is writing and um, trying to persuade their audience. Um, the audience itself, um, who they're writing to, um, if, it depends on um, what the author is trying to achieve and who they're trying to persuade. Um, the persona that the author is taking on, so um, how they're getting into character to try and be more persuasive. Excuse me. <laughs> not feeling so well my throat's kind of sore um, let's see uh, the tone so how they're um, establishing tone within the, um, the speech if they're being serious or silly or however they're trying to um, convey their message um, their evidence how to be more like legitimate um, structure um, like how they're presenting it like um, either it's straightforward or in sort of um, like meandering, going around and around in points, and how that makes them more effective, and then the strategy. So sort of like tools that they use, actual like uh, literary tools, such as like alliteration and simplicity. Um, and then the chapter also breaks down a um, really famous speech, the Gettysburg Address from Abraham Lincoln, and it breaks down um, all kinds of the strategies and stuff uh, used in that. Okay, uh, moving on to Barber, talking about capitalism. Um, he talks about how capitalism marries altruism and self-interest and sort of how like you can feel good spending money knowing that you're both helping yourself and sort of helping the economy at large and how that is a really effective strategy for um, an economy. Um, there's um, also some quotes about how how during crisis, crises and um, a lot of other stuff that um, the American public are often told to uh, spend money such as in 9-11 the mayor of New York told people to spend money in order to help rebuild the city, um, not even like on disaster relief, just to spend money in general to help bolster the economy. Um, he also goes into how advertising sort of generally manipulates us and um, how uh, advertising makes us, our, turns our wants into needs. Um, he uses the, the iPhone as a reference for that and uh, says how every new iPhone is like, um, culturally, it feels like you need to buy every new iPhone so that you can be with the times and uh, not be sort of a social outcast. Um, and he also covers very briefly how um, capitalism sort of invades all parts of life and how if we talked about that with um, government or religion, we would call it sort of totalitarianism. Um, and that it's kind of odd that we don't call capitalism uh, a form of totalitarianism. Okay, um, moving on to LUTs, uh, talking about advertising in general. Um, the main thing he covers in this chapter is weasel words, words such as help, virtually, new, fast, uh, works like anything else, uh, the word like in general, oh, uh, the word, and then the combo like magic. So each of these are used in their own way to kind of um, get people to think that they need a lot of new products. Um, uh, each of them does it in their own way. Help is sort of a very general word that makes the product feel like it is less maybe bad than it is, that it's actually helping you, that it's like uh, it forms, it serves a function when maybe we have to think other things that already serve that function. Um, virtually is a word that makes it seem that um, it's, it's nearly the same, but that kind of comes down to a judgment call of whose judgment is judging on what virtually means or nearly means. Um, new is often slightly tweaked or almost virtually the same. Um, fast is another one that's sort of a judgment call that um, sort of whoever is, is judging it can say if something is fast or faster. Um, works like anything else. Um, another one where you can just sort of um, have an interpretive interpretation of what works like what. Um, and then like magic is sort of mystifying the product, uh, making it seem better than it is or that it is um, like nothing you've ever seen. Um, and then he also covers that no words are wasted in advertising, that everything is 
made in order for more product to be sold and more um, more money to be spent. Uh, moving on to Barthes and uh, his essay on toys, um, he's the pretty a very a very interesting essay in my opinion. Um, he writes about um, France at um, post World War II um, and how like something we don't really think about but is, is very true is that toys influence kids so what we give our kids actually does influence them and shapes uh, who they become and um, how they are um, so when he was writing this essay toys were becoming more and more plastic which is something that um, he talks about later um, so the toys of the time were starting to reflect future roles of kids and not really support creativity they were sort of putting them in boxes so Little boys would get um, like fireman kits and doctor like bags and things like that, sort of to suggest that they should be going into profession. And little girls would get um, things like uh, grocery sets or um, pa like purses or things to suggest um, a sort of just a, a generally feminine nature, but also that of a, a, a homekeeper and not exactly um, a go getter or a career person. Um, as for um, the, what his ideal vision of toys should be is that they should be creative tools for kids and that they should also reflect um, nature. So he was a big fan of uh, wooden toys because of the, um, he said, because they're, they're light and they have, um, they're durable. But um, I think beyond that is that um, wooden toys sort of have this tactility that plastic toys don't and they, they have a feel um, that is not uh, like a plastic toy. It's not smooth, it's, it's rough, it has edges and it kind of um, stimulates kids in a way that I don't think uh, plastic toys do. One second. Gotta stay hydrated. Um, all right, moving on to Ho with um, Craving the Other. Uh, she talks about um, how growing up she was trying to be more American, um, and that led to her having like really weird um, combinations of foods, sort of like she said like noodles on like pizza bagels and stuff like that and just like really weird combinations that sort of got her in trouble with both her uh, American friends and her more uh, traditional uh, Vietnamese family. But uh, she goes on to say that um, she sees white people um, try to appropriate other people's culture and sort of lord their knowledge of other people's culture over their own people. That like it gives them some sort of satisfaction to do that. Um, which I think is fascinating. Uh, moving on to Postral in praise of chain stores. Um, so she says that uh, chain stores offer like big city convenience to small towns, which is a nice thing. Um, small towns before sort of the um, World War II did not really have the same convenience and like um, range of products that big cities would have. Um, and that they make the actual differences of cities stand out. So she uses the, um, I believe a city in Phoenix, I'm not sure exactly, but um, she talks about how the chain stores sort of look like everywhere else, but when you look outside the city, you can see the natural beauty uh, of the desert and things like that. It's uh, something that a lot of other places wouldn't have. Um, there is also a, an argument that um, wanting to preserve the sort of um, local culture of a downtown sort of pushes convenience out and I know this is a problem for us in San Jose because a lot of our stores are so far away from from downtown like the Target is the Target and um, a lot of other stores are, are farther out in the city and it's not as easy to get to them um, and then Bryson uh, talking about the hard sell <clears throat> a lot of his a lot of this chapter is talking about the history of advertising um, sort of starting with Kodak the British camera company and uh, moving on to bigger names, well, bigger names comparatively, such as Coca-Cola and Gillette, and how they sort of were the trailblazers of advertising. Um, a lot of early advertising, and still today, uses fear tactics, telling people that they're fat, ugly, messy, just sort of generally insulting them, making them feel afraid, making them feel like they need more products. Um, and then most brands um, today have been around for about 100 years, making like new brands much harder to come by. Um, and yeah, generally the advertising tries to get us to buy things at any cost. They will make us, they'll belittle us and, and generally, um, just try to get us to buy things even if we don't need them. So yeah, that's, uh, the general wrap up of those chapters.